Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by the Department of Buildings and ASHRAE New York City. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had an impressive 500 people register for today's webinar, and we appreciate the great interest in this topic. Uh, right now, I, I see we have uh, around uh, 200 people uh, with us, and people are still joining. So I want to be mindful of everyone's time, and um, I would like to briefly introduce the new uh, webinar series. And as you may know, the Department of Buildings is working closely with ASHRAE in New York City to deliver a series of webinars for sustainability service providers to share important information on the basics of Local Law 97. This is the first event in a series of webinars which we will be hosting virtually on this platform every few weeks, so please stay tuned for future announcements. Uh, we put this event together because we are aware of the growing demand for this kind of educational program in light of new legislation. Uh, so again, please stay tuned for uh, future announcements. We will be sharing updates on the upcoming events in the coming days. And once we finalize the dates of the future webinars and open registration, we will send email updates ahead of each event. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I want to cover a couple housekeeping items. First, uh, for your awareness, this presentation is being recorded. Second, we wanted to encourage everyone to ask questions in the chat window. Um, we will have a brief Q&A session after the presentations uh, where our presenters will be answering those questions. And the DOB team will also help to address uh, any questions that come up during the webinar. So please uh, uh, take a, a minute to locate the chat uh, window um, on the control panel on your right uh, side of the screen. And one more thing, we offer one PDH credit for this event and we will share a link to the form in the chat in a minute. Uh, so please fill out the form if you would like to receive the PDH certificate. We should be able to issue them for um, uh, such a big event in couple of weeks. So uh, finally, please allow me to introduce our speakers. We have Andrew McLean and Tarek Arafat here with us today. Andrew McLean is a uh, policy and project associate at the New York City Department of Buildings, working in the legal and policy team of the Department's Sustainability Bureau. Andrew supports the Sustainability Bureau's implementation of Local Law 97 and the communication of its requirements to building owners in New York City. Andrew spent the previous three years as a senior policy advisor for the government of the United Kingdom in the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. He developed policies to build a workforce capable of delivering on the UK's building decarbonization goals and to regulate the use of heating oil in homes. Prior to this, he worked with an environmental defense fund to decarbonize road transport and reduce air pollution in Europe. Andrew received a bachelor's degree from the University of Oxford and a master's degree in environmental policy from University College London. Tarek Arafat is the senior policy and data analyst at the New York City Department of Buildings and a key member of DOB's Local Law 97 team working on policy implementation overseeing the Sustainability Bureau's data analytics work. Tarek leads the energy efficiency and emissions reduction efforts at the DOB through policy and technical analysis, focusing on, that, on data-driven decision-making that supports all issues related to sustainable buildings and the clean energy transition. Before joining DOB, Tarek served as the Load Management Program Manager at the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, where he expanded the program across multiple agencies to achieve significant energy and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Tarek holds advanced degrees in urban informatics and data science from New York University, environmental policy and sustainability management from Columbia University, and Urban Sustainability from City College of New York. He earned his Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. He is a licensed professional engineer and a certified energy manager. All right, so now please allow me to virtually hand over the mic to Andrew and Tarek to begin their show. 
Andrew and Tarek, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is all yours. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, I'm just going to uh, start with a brief discussion of the programme by the New York City Accelerator. Um, so, hi all, uh, thank you for coming today. It's really an honour to be presenting to you today, and I hope this will be useful. Um, I'm Andrew McLean, as Luke, Luke introduced me, and um, I'm working as a policy and project analyst at the Department of Buildings. Before we get onto the, the main presentation on the covered buildings lists and, and the dispute system, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the New York City Accelerator Service Provider Program. Um, please do put your questions in, in, in the chat as we go. Um, we're, we in DOB are, are fairly new to this platform, but we're going to try our best to answer them uh, in the chat or at the end as well. And um, where where we talk about links to, to uh, email addresses or to sites, um, I believe Ashray will be posting um, those links in the chat so that so that you can access them in your own time. So, uh, what is the New York City Accelerator? Um, it's a it's a, a city organisation that works on building energy efficiency and decarbonisation in New York City. Um, they provide free guidance for building owners to, to help them understand and comply with local laws, locate and apply for financing, and connect building owners with uh, service providers. The Accelerator also provides no-cost trainings and supports the development of skills that will help deliver energy efficiency and decarbonisation in buildings. And what we'd like to highlight today is the service provider network, which is um, through which the Accelerator sort of collects a set of companies that uh, all work on building energy efficiency and decarbonisation here in New York City and the programme is intended to increase the ease with which building owners and managers can contact and work with service providers to improve their, their building and to comply with Local Law 97. Being a uh, service provider offers strong benefits to contractors. Um, for example, the accelerator can, can make referrals directly to the service providers um, uh, to help building owners contact them and also can include us in, can include contractors in their lookup tool on their site which uh, helps contractors be more visible to building owners who are looking to to get help with their building and there are other benefits to to the contractors um, for example uh, the the program offers access to NYC accelerator account managers and skills training as well as networking events and assistance with, with financing projects. If, uh, if you'd like to know more, you can contact Denise at uh, NYC Accelerator. So you'll see, um, I think, actually her, her email isn't in the chat. If, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully um, Ashray can share her email as well in the chat, but you can see it up there as well. And, um, there are also links to uh, regular information sessions held by NYC Accelerator every Thursday at 11 a.m. And, and if you can't get the link to that, I'm sure Denise can uh, share that with you if you contact her. So um, that's the, the Accelerator's program. And now I'm going to hand over to Tarek to talk about uh, finding and using the Capital Buildings List. So over to you, Tarek. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So yes, uh, uh, why we're all here, right? Thank you for uh, attending this service provider training on Local Law 97. We're going to be very focused on what we're going to cover today, the covered buildings list. So finding and using the covered buildings list. Uh, so this will help building owners, building managers, registered design professionals begin to navigate Local Law 97. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, we'll cover the agenda. Uh, a very high level agenda. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a lag. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we'll, this is the agenda. So we're just gonna make sure to cover some basics around Local Law 97. Uh, we're gonna talk about the covered buildings list and compliance pathways. So that's a very key, that's a, the key critical concept of today. The covered buildings list will outline compliance pathways. We'll describe what that, that means. Uh, we're going to show you where it is on our web page, so finding the CBL, finding the covers building list. And we're going to talk about the internal process a bit, not because it's necessarily relevant to 
the day-to-day -day work of, of, of navigating compliance, but because uh, it'll shed some light uh, on the process we undertake and the preliminary nature of this CBL. Uh, Andrew will then be talking about the dispute process and a, uh, a, a file called the CBL matrix, and that will be breaking down the documents and evidence related to uh, evidencing one's compliance pathway and, and so on. So the covered buildings list, um, yeah, let's get started. So uh, with just local law 97. So just as a reminder, in case uh, these details are, are clear or not, local law 97 is, sets carbon emissions caps for the largest buildings here in New York City. Uh, these are buildings that are uh, represent the bulk of the emissions in New York City. 60% of our emissions come from how we use our energy in buildings, uh, two thirds, so over 60%. And Local R97 covers 60% of that two thirds. So uh, roughly 40% if you're doing the math real quick. So there's a lot of emissions in these large buildings. 60% of the floor area, 60% of our, our building's emissions with a goal of reaching net zero emissions by the year 2050. This aligns with New York City's uh, sustainability initiatives, right? This is something that's been going on for several mayoral administrations beginning really in 2009 under the Bloomberg administration. Uh, so this is an, a long line of sustainable uh, initiatives here in New York to help prepare us for climate change, make our buildings more efficient, uh, more resilient, and, um, and just better for our health and comfort. Uh, I won't be, uh, I'll, next but not right here, I'll be talking about the three buckets of compliance. So those details will come next. And just as a reminder, when buildings are above their emissions limits, they might be subject to fines. Uh, according to the most recent data, uh, some of you may or may have not have seen this, but right now we project buildings to be roughly 90% compliant for those that need to show compliance beginning next year. And I'll talk a bit more about the compliance timelines as that really definitely connects to the compliance pathways. So who's subject to Local Law 97? Uh, this is about the largest buildings once again. So individual buildings that are over 25,000 square feet and multiple buildings on a lot that are over 50,000 square feet. And you can see the rest of the details here, two or more condominium buildings governed by the same board that together exceed 50,000. Um, so that's roughly capturing the size component. Now within buildings and this uh, information that we'll be looking at together with the CBL, there's what is called the borough block lot, the BBL. Now the borough block lot is a property or lot and some of you may be used to this terminology uh, different, to different levels, uh, but Local Law 97, it's a compliance law at the building level. So it's, it's important to recognize that the covered buildings list will be representing BBLs, borough block lot, which, is, which are properties. The vast majority of the BBLs on our covered buildings list, according to the data available to us, are one building on one lot, but there are many buildings, there are many lots that have many buildings. And so this is part of the preliminary nature of the CBL. So I, I may say this word preliminary many times to really emphasize that the, the data that we have is the best granularity that exists at this current state and time. And ultimately the process through reporting compliance, which is not, we're not gonna go into those details today, Will, will will work itself out over time to develop the granularity through the inputs from owners and RDPs. Uh, so if that's not clear, you know, maybe just hold on for a second to just really recognize the distinction of the concept. BBL and, and building is something we're gonna talk about just as a, as a reminder of what is actually on the CBL and the work that a building owner will need to do with a legal rep representative and with a registered design professional. Uh, so those details are why we'll also explain compliance pathways uh, and our process to assemble the, the data uh, as, a, as a way of uh, showing the, the different programs and statuses that allow us to recognize preliminarily where we think you are in the, in the compliance uh, requirements realm. So anyway, probably enough about that. Let's. Uh, Let's talk about what, 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 what the compliance pathways are. What are these buckets, right? So there's essentially three compliance buckets, right? Very high level, there are three types of requirements under Local Law 97. Now we will be focusing on the private sector buildings, uh, 
buckets, which are the one on the left and the one in the center. So just these two, because these are the ones that are for the owner, private owners like yourselves. Uh, and I'll just mention, I'll just sort of you know say it to just kind of get it out of the way. On the right-hand side are the portfolio-wide emissions reductions. That's the requirements for NYCHA and city buildings. And that's not something the Department of Buildings is regulating. So for those of you that may uh, have thought that the city buildings are off the hook, that's not true. They have their own local law 97 targets and requirements. So now back to the, for us today, the focus of today, uh, the two buckets, I'll start with the one on the left, are annual emissions limits. These are often referred to as Article 320, which is just the where the provision is of Local Law 97 is in two articles under Title 28, Article 320 and Article 321. That's the one in the center. So starting with Article 320, these are annual emissions where buildings are subject to annual emissions, those caps, every year all the way to net zero by 2050. Now there's a bit more detail to that because there's various types of affordable housing that actually have uh, delays with their Article 320 uh, compliance year start it, start point, starting point. Uh, you could see that in the, in the bottom, there's notes about that, but I'll actually talk about that more. So just for now, there's emissions limits that get more stringent over time. Now, these are the buildings we're expecting, you know, would undertake energy efficiency work, uh, decarbonization work like fuel switching, uh, uh, perhaps uh, sol community solar, uh, and, and so on. So right, just I'm just throwing out some of the sort of uh, common energy conservation measures and decarbonization strategies that may be uh, necessary to uh, move towards compliance and prepare for the uh, you know sustainable future we all need. Uh, anyhow, these are the sort of First, go-to concepts that people will often think about with uh, Local Law 97. There are limits and they're annual. So we'll talk about the delays. There's just two kinds of delays. A, uh, a 2020, uh, right now in 2024, the first set of buildings will need to report in 2025, May of 2025. Those of you familiar with the benchmarking program know that similar uh, time frame and reporting cycle exists where there every year there's the performance year so let's use 2024 is the performance year well reporting will be May 1st of 2025 same is true for 2024 local law 97 compliance under this first bucket article 320 uh, there's also uh, certain housing programs and statuses that will have buildings with a two-year delay so complying uh, performance for 2026 complying the following year, and then performance for 2035. So a two-year delay and an 11-year delay. All Article 320, all subject to annual emissions, but phased in over time, right? With the same goal at the end, carbon neutral net zero by 2050. That is the bulk of our buildings under the law, 34,000, as you can see here. Um, okay, so that's Article 320, that's the first bucket. The second bucket, is the lower cost one-time compliance. Now, what is that? Well, this is, this is the shorthand we use, Title 28, Article 321. So Article 321 buildings, these are certain types of affordable housing. Uh, and I'll talk more just high level about affordable housing and the distinction of how that is the, either the two-year delay, the 11-year delay, or this Article 321. And you'll see also a little bit with more of that with the CBL matrix that Andrew will cover uh, later, but I just want to point out that the Article 321, the center bucket, is essentially rent regulated buildings where there's more than 35%, greater than 35% rent regulated units. This is also where houses of worship, and we'll talk a little bit, you know, Andrew will talk a bit more about it than I will, I'll touch on it a bit. Houses of worship also have this one-time compliance. Now, what is this one-time compliance? This, well, this one-time compliance is work uh, and reporting that will well, work that may have to happen this year, 2024, with reporting also in 2025. So if you just in your mind think about the timeline component, we've got buildings that need to report under Article 320 and also under Article 321, the first two buckets. So this, so this middle bucket here, Article 321, can either comply through meeting uh, the 2030 limits in 2024 using the 2030 emissions coefficients, now, if that's not clear, you know, that is that will be covered. These details will be covered in future trainings. So don't want to overwhelm you with too much detail about uh, calculation processes and so on. 
we want you to really understand these compliance pathways. So once again, 2030 limits in 2024. Those details are actually in the uh, Article 321 filing guide, which is also on our website right now, um, which, we, like I said, we won't be going into that, but the reference material is available. Uh, or the 13 up to 13 applicable prescription energy conservation measures, PECMs. So that's Article 321. That's the one-time compliance. So these are the two concepts that we really want you to walk away with. So you, as you navigate and understand preliminarily where you are on the covered buildings list, how your compliance requirements would change, right? So this is the beginning of the navigating all of that. So um, hopefully that was uh, very clear. Uh, and so, um, you know, let's, uh, let's look at what's on our website. So where is the covered buildings list? Where is the covered buildings list matrix and the FAQ, right? Well, this is a, uh, a mocked up depiction of our website, meaning the website is to the right hand side, which you see with the white and blue text. Uh, and what is around it are essentially a mapping of these concepts that we just talked about. Well, beginning with the first concept, the two buckets, the Article 320 that covers the bulk of the buildings under this law, and then the one-time compliance Article 321. Um, you know, these are you know over 40,000 know, buildings, as you could see, uh, and you know a lot of emissions related to all these buildings. But then going back to the timeline. Article 320 has buildings that are complying in 2024. Uh, that's the first list. Then we have buildings with the two-year delay, the 2026 performance year, reporting the following. Then the 11-year delay, Article 320, which is then 2035. Um, and just to sort of uh, mention something that we'll see again, but I just sort of to key you in on the, the, the naming, uh, the second one that you could see, the 2026 rent regulated properties. So this is a just calling out that this is a type of rent regulated uh, property that is being identified on on this list. Uh, we'll talk about what will actually identify you preliminarily with the agency partners we work with. We'll, we'll show you that, but just want to uh, point out when when people are thinking that affordable housing falls under a certain type of compliance. Uh, it's important to recognize that it may be the Article 321, the one-time compliance, the, which you see at the bottom, or it may be one of these uh, Article 320 uh, requirement sets where there's a two, the two-year delay or the 11-year delay. So just pointing that out because this is often the kind of question that we'll we'll, we'll get, and Andrew will go into that much more uh, what that what that means. But I just want to point that out because you will find these four types of CBLs on our website, and they fall under these two buckets, and then you're seeing them represented by the delays and then the, you know, the 321 at the bottom. So these are the two buckets right here in four lists. With that, there's a concept we would like you to, to be able to uh, recognize with these lists, and that is what you see on the, all the way on the right-hand side, which are pathways, which have been given numbers. Those are, those are numbers. CP stands for compliance pathway and then a number. Com compliance path zero, compliance path one, path two, compliance path three, zero, one, two, three. So in a in a tiered format. Now I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up, but just we want you to be able to organize and map for yourself. When you go to our website, this is what you're seeing. And so, um, you know, there's more on this page than our website, but this is essentially the translation between these concepts. So sort of high level concept of the buckets, to the lists that are available to you to help you navigate your compliance requirements, at least get started, because uh, this is preliminary in nature, and you'll understand what that means and what, what that looks like when you see a bit more on that process, which will be coming up. And then this tiering, this pathway number system is an important uh, way of just recognizing how the process works from a data standpoint. So. Um, very important here, but anyway, these are the useful links. Just, sorry, I don't want to uh, forget to mention that. You actually got these in the chat already, but this covered buildings list is on that first link. The CBL matrix, which Andrew will be spending much more time with, the, the one that's available to you, uh, it is also here. And then the FAQ page. Also, Andrew will be talking about that more. But just so you know, it's all on this web page for you. So when it comes to the covered buildings list and figuring out what, where, where you might be, 
uh, and get started, this is where we'd want you to go. So um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, let's get into the process a bit. Okay, so we're just giving you a, a sort of peek into the process, not to overwhelm you. I mean, this is, if you could see, this is purposely blurred because we don't want you to try to read all of this detail because it's actually, you know, uh, not important to get the, the main concept, which is just, we work with a lot of partners to gather the best data available about the, pr the properties on these lists. They're meeting the size uh, uh, component of it, the, the largest buildings in New York, and the various housing programs that may determine the various statuses. Um, so and anyhow, um, so yeah, so let's, so let's zoom in on, on some of this. So um, here we go again. So now we're looking at those, those pathway numbers here. So I want I want you to just think of it as as here we are looking at Article 320 that first bucket once again with the buildings that need to comply in 2024 it meets the size requirements over 25,000 square feet multiple buildings on the lot over 50 two or more condominium buildings um, here it is right so these are the buildings that are, are the performance this year will be reported on in in May of next year. 90% of the buildings, according to the most recent data available to us, where we use the benchmarking data to, to estimate and calculate compliance, 90% appear to be compliant. So great news for everybody. Um, uh, if you're not, you know, most buildings are just barely over their limits, according to our data. So uh, we're not going to get into that in, in any detail today, but just saying that to just assure you uh, this is just helping to navigate your compliance and and when you need to get started. Uh, so now the next one, the bottom row, compliance path one. Now what is that? There, it's the two-year delay, the 2026 Article 320 two-year delay. Now how do you end up on this two-year delay? Well, the preliminary data that we get from the Depart uh, DHCR, the state entity, entity that uh, regulates the you know uh, affordable housing and rent regulated information. Uh, is it providing this to us? So that's one unit to less than 35% rent regulated. So that's compliance path one. So this is a type of affordable housing that is not in the Article 321 one-time compliance, but a type of affordable housing with a two-year delay. Uh, so ho hopefully that's clear once again. These are the first two buckets under Article 320. The first, This is the first bucket, I should say, under Article 320. And now we've covered the two-year delay. Next, we'll cover the 11-year delay. So as you can see here, a lot more uh, entities are working with us to help us identify which covered buildings list we think you may belong on preliminarily, right? Like I said, uh, maybe you'll get tired of that word by the end, but I'll, I want to remind you, this is why we always recommend work with a legal representative and a registered design professional because the, these details are need to be uh, looked through. And that is going to be, that is in the guidance that will be forthcoming. Article 320 filing guides will be out soon. Uh, and so Article 321 filing guides are already out on our website. Uh, now, once again, Article 320, 2035 compliance, the 11 year delay, still in the first bucket. And you can see we work with DHCR, the Department of Finance, HDC, HPD, and um, this is also a type of affordable housing that is under the 11-year delay, right? Mitchell Lama buildings, income restricted, uh, with different tax uh, exemptions. So this is then compliance path two. Um, and so now next, we, just to, to sort of wrap up the, the compliance paths, we have uh, the Article 321 is on the top. And just for reference, the bottom are the, the the third bucket that we're not talking about, but just so you see it, we this is how we work with DCAS and NYCHA to identify properties that are owned and managed and, and run by the those city agencies so that we know that they are not part of the other two compliance uh, buckets. So anyway, back to our Article 321, uh, there's, you know, the, these are the one-time compliance buildings, properties, with the, either the prescriptive measures, the 13 PECMs, or meeting your 2030 limits in 2024. Once again, DHCR is a key uh, supporter of the data that we receive to, to help us understand what, what properties may fall, buildings may fall under this, and that's when there are over 35% rent regulated. 
So earlier we saw a two-year delay for less than 35%, with one, one unit to less than 35%, to now over 35%, you are on the Article 321 uh, pathway here, second bucket, right? That middle bucket from, the, from before. There's also other programs, Section 8, Houses of Worship, I mentioned before, uh, Houses of Worship, we essentially need you to self-identify because they're, the, there's not reliable data that is 100% accurate, I would say. There's data that can correlate to this, but we've learned over the years at DOB that we need you to really self-identify, and Andrew will give you an example of what kind of uh, evidence we're looking for. But all this to say, uh, that's where what Andrew covers on the CBL matrix that you can see on our website will will help you understand. So don't worry about these details. This is just to recognize this is a, the rigorous process that we go through to try to to assign your position on those covered buildings lists you saw on our website. Um, so uh, hopefully that's uh, not too much. So really we're just going to you know look at our website again, the website page, and you know here's what it, you know on the right hand side here's what it looks like. That's that first link there, sustain, you know, the cover, uh, Buildings Code Sustainability. These are those four CBLs that fall under those two buckets. The three top ones are Article 320, right? 2024 compliance, 2026, 2035. The last one, you know, uh, Roman numeral uh, four, Romanet I, uh, four, the, that's the Article 321. And just so you see it, uh, you know, really highlight for you the CBL matrix that, that Andrew's gonna show much more detail uh, is also there and the CBL FAQ, which he will go into detail. But so now you know what's on our webpage, you know, the, and these links are those this information. When it comes to starting your compliance, you know, please look at our website and, you know, help, which will help you navigate these, uh, these various compliance pathways. So um, what I think uh, one more real quick, um, here's just, and, I, and I'm just going to orient you to the to the main pieces, and Andrew's going to actually talk about this more. But these are the compliance pathway numbers we're seeing again in the yellow now: CP0, compliance path zero, and compliance path one. So these are just like we saw earlier: uh, the Article 320, 2024 compliance. That's you know what, what we're looking at right now, and then the two-year delay, Article 322 year delay. That's the the, the bottom one. So this is what the CBL matrix looks like on the website with the links you have. We just looked at that internal one just so you could see all the work that we go through to try to preliminary identify you, try to give you the best information we have available on our website so you can get started. Now, Andrew, you know, he's gonna take it from here. So I hope that was helpful and clear and you know, it was a pleasure uh, going through this with you today. So Andrew, please. Thanks very much, Tarek. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit now about the, the correspondence and the disputes process that, that we have. Um, and um, yeah, Tarek's covered much of the detail of the different pathways and how the, how the covered buildings list works. So um, onto, onto disputes and you know the, the, the more nitty gritty aspects of when people come and talk to us about their concerns. So um, Department of Buildings has an email address, uh, ghgemissions.nyc.gov. And that's the email address, address that we use to uh, field inquiries from, from building owners and members of the public that, that have questions about Local Law 97. And um, the, the, the questions that we get can be split into sort of three broad types. Um, there's simple correspondence, there's contesting data, and then there's new data. So the first category of correspondence, uh, simple correspondence, isn't really a dispute. It's it's mostly where someone needs information um, and uh, that they've come to us for it. And you can see on the right here we have we have an FAQ which um, there's a link to in the chat at the top. And, and this this does field a, uh, answer a lot of the questions that we get. But of, of course, you know, not everyone has seen this FAQ. Um, but so the the questions that that people come to on this will mostly not uh, require a change in any building status. That, that's not going, it's not gonna mean that building ends up on a different, different compliance pathway. Um, it, it's just, for example, um, someone can't find their, uh, their building's BBL on the covered buildings list. So we might help them with that. 
uh, they may be confused on how the CBLs work. For example, their building might not be the only building on the on the BBL, um, or the building may span multiple BBLs, or the building's BBL might show up on, on multiple CBLs. And, and when we get questions like this, we'll, we would explain uh, how, how the CBLs work and what this means for their building's compliance. For example, uh, if someone's saying, why isn't my building's BBL on a CBL? Um, it, it should be the, the, the buildings are greater than 25,000 square feet. We might explain, well, that's because if there are multiple buildings on the lot, the, uh, the building sort of square footage has to be over 50K rather than 25K. Uh, in order to be covered on, on a CBL. And uh, we also get some correspondence about building ownership, particularly from co-op co members saying that they're, they're not the building manager, why are they getting letters from Department of Buildings? And in that case, we'd explain that the building's compliance is, is the same regardless who's getting the correspondence. So they, they should probably work with the co-op board to make sure they're complying and that, that when they file reports for Local Law 97, they can change who would be getting correspondence from, from us. Um, we, we also get uh, quite a lot of correspondence disputing a building's placement on a particular pathway, but not providing evidence to support that dispute. And um, where we don't get documentation or evidence to back up a dispute, we, we can't act on it. And, and so we, we go back to them saying, you know, please submit the evidence that, that uh, backs it up and then we can, we can, then we can act on it. The second type of, uh, of, of correspondence is where people are telling us that the data that we have is, is wrong and so their building has been placed on the wrong covered buildings list, which, which, which does happen, um, where, particularly where uh, data is changing over the course of the year. So we, would, uh, we might have data from a partner that, that no longer reflects the, the state of a building. So um, as you've seen, and as Tarek has, has been going through, there are a number of, of compliance pathways for different building types. Um, and to successfully dispute the placement of a building on a particular pathway, um, it requires evidence. And so the, the documentation requirements uh, for disputes is available at the uh, covered building list matrix, uh, which you can see here. Um, and you know, in, in, in yellow, the column, uh, sets out what sort of documentation is required in order to, to prove that you are a particular type of, or that the building is a particular type of building. And um, there, there's a, um, a Department of Buildings uh, document that sets that out, but there's also um, a, a Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, uh, HBD document that sets that out, um, which I think we've linked in the chat. So between those, that should um, ensure that you can you can tell what sort of documentation is needed to to prove your building is a particular kind. And it's important to remember that that there is a hierarchy of pathways. So if a building has evidence that it should be on compliance path two because it's income restricted, but also that it should be on compliance path three because one of its tenants is using section eight vouchers, then the larger number three rather than two takes uh, priority and so the the building would uh, come under compliance pathway three rather than two however it might appear on both covered buildings lists so so you've got to be uh, you've got to check through all of the cbls just to make sure that your building isn't on on more than one and ensure that you go with the highest priority pathway um, the most common disputes that we've been getting so far uh, when a building is disputing um, the compliance pathway they're under due to the number of rent regulated units. Um, so remember if there is at least one regulated unit but less than 35% of the units in the building are rent regulated then the building would go onto compliance pathway one which would give them a slight delay in compliance. Um, but if the percentage of rent regulated units is above 35% then it moves into compliance pathway three, the prescriptive pathway uh, which has different requirements. So, so it's it, it, you know it makes a big difference to to buildings which path they're on, and it, it it's important, understandably, for building owners to inform us where where we haven't uh, got the the most up to date information on the number of vent regulated units in their building. So, um, as 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 I've been saying, when a building is not on the right pathway, 
building owners need to to uh, send us the the specific documentation and the details of their building. And um, in that case, what happens is we'll we'll you know we'll read through that correspondence. We'll we'll check it all out, make sure that that they have read the our CBLs correctly. Um, and then, if so, we'll send on that that information to our, the relevant bodies, which which right in this case be uh, DHCR. And then our partner organisation um, will make a designation on whether the dispute is correct. And if so, then we will update our records and we'll we'll inform the correspondent that, that they're right. They should be on on this other uh, pathway, and then then that's what they should be complying with. So we get a number of these types of disputes, um, but it, it can take a moment to resolve as we have to talk to our partners to to confirm that their dispute is right and then to make the change. The final type of correspondence is where building owners are supplying new data. Um, as Tarek mentioned, there, there are certain types of building that we just don't have access to, to solid data about. So the only way that we can know that this building should have that particular designation is when a building owner tells us. So the first of these types is the garden style apartment, um, which is essentially uh, residential buildings of three stories or, or fewer where no equipment serves more than 25,000 square feet, no heating equipment or cooling equipment serves more than 25 square feet. And so they're functionally separate buildings from a heating perspective. So you know, even if all of these buildings are on the same BBL, um, uh, you know, bigger than 25,000 square feet, so they might otherwise qualify under Local Law 97, uh, for this, uh, under this designation, they are exempt from the requirements of Local Law 97. But they have to tell us that we don't have a way of knowing that currently. So um, they need to get certification from an RDP confirming those details. And then they share the information with us but with the uh, email address that I mentioned earlier. Then we mark them as a garden style apartment and we'll, we'll confirm with them that they don't need to comply with the requirements of Local Law 97. And um, the second of the, the sort of dispute is houses of worship, which again, we, we don't have solid data on. Um, the, the goal with this designation of hazard worship is to, uh, to to mark out buildings where the space dedicated to uh, assembly for religious purposes is is a large one. So we're not trying to capture um, a building such as a school, which is primarily not a place of worship, even if it has a small sort of uh, part of it that is designated for religious assembly. What we are trying to capture is something uh, with, which is predominantly um, and uh, for religious assembly, for example, a, a church, and um, we define that as where the space is greater than 50% of the building um, is being used as assembly space for religious purposes. So greater than 50%, not not um, not 50%, but greater than. So uh, those are the types of correspondence and disputes that we receive. Uh, thank you very much.